Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Kevin Mitchell. He's Associate Professor of Genetics and Neuroscience at Trinity College, Dublin. And last time we talked about his book, Innate, and today we're going to focus mostly on psychological epigenetics. So, Dr. Mitchell, welcome to the show. It's again a pleasure to have you on. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ricardo. Pleasure to be back. Okay, great. So, I mean, epigenetics, this is, uh, I guess, a new area of studies. Uh, uh, more or less new, but, well, but I, I think that what I want to say is more than you, it's very hyped now. Yeah. So, uh, but what is it really about? Uh, well, it's, that's a good question because the word means many different things and those different meanings get a bit conflated and, um, and confused sometimes. So it's funny because it's a really, uh, in molecular biology, it's a really technical term. Um, and somehow it's, it's gotten into the public domain and sort of captured public imagination in a way that, um, I mean, I can, I, we can understand how it happened, but it's a, bit, it's a bit of an odd story for such a technical term. So the idea is basically it's a, it refers to really a mechanism for regulating gene expression. So in every cell in our body, we've got the same human genome, 20,000 genes. But different cells, so each of those genes is a recipe for a protein, basically. Uh, but different cells need different proteins. So skin cells will express some of those genes. That, that means the DNA is turned into RNA and the RNA is turned into protein. So of the 20,000 genes, skin cells maybe express 13,000 of them. And, you know, liver cells express an overlapping set of 13,000 and brain cells, an overlapping set of 18,000 or something like that. So each cell has a profile where some genes are turned on and some genes are turned off. And that's what makes that cell whatever type of cell it is. Now, during development, as an embryo develops, you know, it starts as a single cell, it, it gets bigger and bigger. And what happens is it gets, it gets patterned by signals inside the, inside the embryo that's, that eventually sort of decide, well, this is going to be the head and this is going to be the tail. This is going to be the outside. This is going to be the inside. And then as it develops more and more, this is going to be the liver. This is going to be the skin and so on. And those signals will instruct. So the, each cell has a kind of a, you know, receptors for different sig signals that it receives. And then depending on what signals it gets, it turns on or off certain genes. So that's how your skin cells come to be skin cells. They're told to be skin cells. Now, the problem is over time, after an embryo has developed, the signals that told the cells what to be may be gone. They're not, they're not there anymore necessarily, but the cells have to retain that fate, that, that profile of gene expression. And so one way that they do that is through this mechanism of epigenetics where they, um, they, they turn the genes on or off and they keep them. They sort of lock them in that, uh, in that position. And the, there's a, a variety of proteins or different mechanisms that are, that are involved. Um, for example, sometimes the DNA gets wrapped up really tightly. So the DNA chromosomes are associated with different sets of proteins. And you, you might've seen these pictures of DNA wrapped around little, it looks like right. beads on a string. So, so those, are, those are called chromatin proteins. And the chromatin kind of comes in two varieties. It's either open, which allows the gene to be expressed, or it's closed, or it's right. active, or active or inactive. That's a simplification, but that's the idea. Um, and so epigenetics is a mechanism that forms and, and maintains those chromatin structures to keep genes turned on or off. So does that make sense? Y yes, it makes sense. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if this applies here, but I've heard of mechanisms like methylation and sometimes also acetylation, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So there's, so chemically speaking, there's a few ways that it works. Um, the DNA can be marked with chemical groups like methyl groups or the proteins that make up those, that the, the chromatin proteins themselves can be uh, modified with methylation or acetylation at different, different parts. And those are marks that are uh, associated with the genes either being active or inactive. So during development, in a sense, it acts like a cellular memory. Right? So the cell remembers the signals that it got. Um, and at that early stage, 
the signal is translated into a gene that binds um, the, D, the regulatory elements of a, sorry, a protein that binds the regulatory elements of a gene and that actively turns it on, on or off, sort of acutely turns it on or off. Um, but later on, it becomes more like a chronic state. It's sort of chronically turned on or off. So it acts as a memory of the signals that it got. And sometimes um, those memories can be uh, that that state of chromatin, the chromatin profile can be transmitted from one cell to its daughter cells if it divides. So it can be transmitted through cell division. So, um, or it can be in a sense recapitulated in the next, in the next generation. So there's two, there's two ideas there that people have kind of latched onto a bit. One is the idea that it's a, that it's a, a mechanism for memory. Mm -hmm. And the other is that it's inheritable. Okay. Now both of those are defined in what I just told you at the cellular level. Right. But, but, but people have started to, to sort of say, well, okay, but maybe that that happens as a mechanism of psychological memory. And maybe those, those mechanisms of psychological memory can be passed from one organism to its descendants, not just from one cell to its descendants. And that's where things get a bit confused. Um, and there's lots of, you know, arguments back and forth um, for whether that's really a thing or not. Um, and, you know, arguments really about whether you would even actually expect it to be a thing in sophisticated organisms that that have brains, um, you know, is, is that how you would expect memory to be formed? Um, and why, why would you want memories to be transmitted from one organism to its descendants if, you know, we have brains that are good for behavioral flexibility, for example. So, so there's all, but, but anyway, that's the, that's the, um, the kind of background and it's gotten into, you know, the public imagination, I, I think mm -hmm. by, um, this idea that epigenetics is a, a mechanism whereby factors from the outside, analogous to signals from outside a cell in a developing embryo, can turn genes on or off. And so some people uh, like um, Deepak Chopra, for example, has really latched onto this idea, um, you know, thinks that turning genes on or off equates to turning traits on or off. Right. And, you know, for some things, fine, you know, if, if the trait is, for example, how, uh, how tanned your skin happens to be right now, then that is controlled by turning on genes up or down, right, in response to mm -hmm. an environmental factor, which is sunlight. But if a trait is some aspect of your personality, well, it just doesn't relate to the function of any particular gene in that way where you're just turning a dial um, up or down. So there's a sort of a set of, of misunderstandings about what epigenetics is, and then it's transposed onto a deeper misunderstanding of how genes relate to psychological traits, which, mm -hmm. which is way, way more complex and totally indirect emergent kind of effects. I mean, we talked about it the last time. Um, so yeah, so there's multiple sort of models going on at the same time, um, but it's, it's appealing in a, to, to some people who are sort of in a self, the self-help um, industry, because you can, you can tell people, well, okay, you know, your traits are a certain way because your, your DNA, you know, your genes are this way, but that's not the end of it. You can override those, those things and, and epigenetics is the mechanism how. Now, I would be the first person to say you can, in a sense, alter your behavior you know, you can recognize some things about your own psychology and do things about that. You don't have to be trapped by that in a deterministic sense, but there's no need to invoke methylation of histone proteins to explain that. It's just the wrong level to look for an explanation. And it's a kind of a appealing to the scientific term, right? It sounds cool. It sounds, it, it adds truthiness to, to these kinds of claims um, without there being a lot of, um, scientific merit to the to the idea itself mm -hmm. so let me just take a few steps back because we're already getting into the psychological side of things mm -hmm. so how far back uh, do we need to go for us to find people who already identified this sort of mechanisms i mean when did the the discipline of epigenetics really start 
really interesting. You know what? I, you should talk to my um, my, my colleague um, John Greeley, who's a, he's a uh, friend in, in in New York, because he's uh, just actually written a book about the history of the term itself. And um, but you know, even before the term came to in, into usage, people have been studying um, the you know this mechanism of gene regulation for as long as they've been studying gene regulation basically mm -hmm. because um, I mean what's interesting it started actually well to my knowledge at least some of the early experiments in fruit flies where um, so the, there's a ton of experiments looking at development in fruit flies and you could find these mutations that affected you know formation of the of the antennae or the wings or the legs or uh, parts of the embryo and so on and a lot of those were found and they were, were really specific you know if you mutate the gene um, it always affects the antenna or it always affects the wings or so on. But there was a different class of genes that could be mutated where, strangely, you'd, you'd start getting phenotypes all over the place. It wasn't really consistent at all, and it seemed to depend on if there were sort of mutations in the background in that, in that fly. And it turned out that those were in some of these proteins that regulate chromatin structure, and they do that for all kinds of genes. And the explanation for why one one line of flies that carried this mutation would show phenotypes in the wings, for example, was because the, the, this sort of general dysregulation that happened when they mutated the chromatin genes manifested in that line in the, in the regulation of wing genes because they had other mutations there that, that were otherwise kind of cryptic and, and weren't manifest. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's a, yeah, so there's a long line of, of you know, research like that, that looks at the role of this cellular memory during development. Um, the term itself, I mean, the, you know, it goes back to Aristotle, to epigenesis, really, as the idea of the, the unfolding of an individual during development. Um, and that's where, um, you know, some of the terminology came about. Uh, but the, uh, the, the actual usage of the term epigenetics to refer to this chromatin regulation is much more recent, but I can't remember exactly when it came to when it came to prominence. Mm -hmm. But are these epigenetic mechanisms something that fits into modern evolutionary theory, or something that falls outside it? Well, so some people would like to think that there's a role for epigenetics in in evolution, which is in um, Sort of in the area of phenotypic plasticity. So the I would the, the idea would be you have um, you know a certain set of genes DNA sequence in an organism that specifies a certain phenotype, but maybe uh, you know if there are environmental factors change, the phenotype could respond to that. And of course you know the simplest cells, bacteria, amoebae, whatever, of course they respond to their environment. That's how they that's how they manifest agency actually is, is by altering, reconfiguring their, their, um, the, their, their internal biochemistry and metabolism and patterns of gene expression. So there's nothing, there's nothing unusual about that. that that's how cells work really. Um, the idea in an evolutionary sense is that you might have a, a change like that, that is induced by some environmental factor that is where, where the mark, is uh, you know the modification of the DNA. The DNA sequence is not changed, but the modification of the DNA that affects whether the gene is turned on or, on or not is inherited. Excuse me, in the next generation. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a Lamarckian um, kind of mechanism, or the, that's the idea. Is it's an inheritance of acquired characters, basically. So what uh, an, an experience happens in this generation, and this is a mechanism whereby the next generation doesn't have to have that experience to have the phenotypic change. Um, there's not really good evidence that that's actually the case outside of some some plants and some nematodes, where that kind of thing might happen and most of those cases seem to be really related to at least in nematodes to to um, mechanisms for shutting down retroviruses or parasites transposable elements that get into the DNA where it's just it's, it's kind of like an immune mechanism almost the the cell wraps up the, those retroviruses really tightly in this chromatin and that state can be inherited for a, a, a few generations um, but otherwise, there isn't a lot of evidence for that 
mechanism really happening in other species. That people argue that it does in mammals, but um, mm -hmm. I think the evidence for that's really poor. But if it did, it would give a a parallel mechanism to Darwinian evolution, which relies on changes in DNA sequence and natural selection, choosing the best ones. And the idea is it kind of would give organisms some breathing room. Say there's some environmental change, they could adapt plastically using this mechanism, um, and, and that could last for a few generations, long enough for selection to act on, um, or for new mutations to arise, or for selection to act on mutations that or variation that might have already existed that, that you know, in the previous environment wasn't doing anything um, in, in such a way that the organism kind of is, is not immediately killed by whatever the sort of environmental crisis was. It manages to, to adapt a little bit and then Darwinian evolution can take over again. Um, you know, again, it's a, it's a nice hypothesis. I don't, I haven't seen a lot of direct evidence for that. Um, there may be some in, you know, in, in single-celled creatures, but even there, I'm not, I'm not really aware of a of a slam dunk, um, you know, exhibition of that um, of that kind of mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, since you touched on transgenerational epigenetics, uh, what about imprinting? Is that uh, an epigenetic mechanism? How does it work exactly? Yeah, it is. So. Um, so imprinting is, is, we see it in, in mammals and we see it in some plants. It's a really strange phenomenon where um, when, you know, when, a, when, an, egg, when a, an egg is formed or a sperm, uh, of course, there's two in, in every one of us, there's two copies of each chromosome. But in sperm or eggs, you just get one copy. And then they come together in the fertilized egg. So you have a, a maternally inherited copy of chromosome one and a paternally inherited copy of chromosome one. And the same for all the other um, all the other chromosomes. And most of the time, if you have whatever gene A that's located on, you know, chromosome one, um, then both copies of that gene will be expressed, both the maternal and the paternal copies. So you have two, two copies, both making protein. Right. But, but sometimes, for some genes, really rare uh, ones, only the maternal gene is expressed or only the paternally inherited copy is expressed. And the mechanism whereby that is established is that in the formation of eggs or sperm, a mark is, is a chemical modification is put on the DNA, usually, usually methylation, um, where the maternal copy that you inherit may be methylated. And that's a signal within the fertilized egg to, to, to turn off that gene and to wrap it up in chromatin, like I said, and really keep it off. And, and then you get just one copy left. There's a whole load of potential reasons for why that mechanism might have evolved that have to do with, um, at least a theory, that have to do with a competition between male and female, um, where it's in the male's interest for their embryos to get really big, to grow really big. And it's in the female's interest to not let that happen because it's really dangerous for the, for the female and it, and it uh, limits her future reproductive um, abilities. So the, the idea is there's a sort of a war of the sexes going on that, that the, the maternal you know, ones wants to keep the, the expression of growth factors and things low and the paternal ones want to keep it high. Um, and this mechanism has evolved because of that. But um, so, yeah, I mean, that is an epigenetic mechanism and it is transmitted in the sense, well, I mean, it's directly put into the sperm or eggs, right? It's directly in the gametes and that manifests directly in the fertilized egg. So it's not really transgenerational in the, uh -huh. in the normal sense of that definition, which requires it to go through the, through the germline back into an adult and through the germline again. Um, so, but yeah, it, it is a, obviously a, a known mechanism. And the interesting thing is that um, when you have a fertilized egg, most of the chromatin marks that are in it are wiped away, right? I mean, because right. it, it has to do a whole new thing. It, ha it has to be able to make cells that can make everything in the embryo. It has to, it has to um, wipe out all of the instructions that it got before and start with a clean slate. So it's like rebooting the whole genome, basically, mm -hmm. in, in a fertilized egg. And in fact, that's a, you, can, you can do that artificially when you make an induced pluripotent stem cell 
you take a skin cell and you can revert it back to that fate. Um, but imprints manage to make it through that rebooting. So they're, they're maintained through that process. And that, um, that sort of establishes a precedent, I think, that people look to that say, well, well okay, well, if, if those marks can be maintained, through, you know, put there in, in, the, in the gametes and maintained through embryogenesis, then maybe other marks could also be put through that way. And I don't think there's any evidence that other ones are, but it's, it, the precedent certainly on a molecular level is there. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is right or not, but doesn't that rebooting also occur during meiosis when the germline cells are being formed? Yeah, well, when the germline cells are, I mean, the germline cells, like any other cell, have a profile of gene expression. Okay. Um, that, but, but sperm and egg also have a profile of gene expression. Mm -hmm. Now, in sperm, as it happens, most of the genes are, are turned off. Um, but in eggs, there's lots of genes that are turned on and they're, they're making proteins that are going to be necessary for the fertilized egg to develop properly. So you, you have to have the right profile of proteins in the egg to kick right. off, to kick off the process initially. Um, and so in mammals, you know, by the second division, you're already getting the, the, the genome of the embryo driving things. But in other species, like in flies, for example, the maternal genome, you know, the maternal factors carry out a lot of the first steps of development before the embryonic uh, thing even even kicks off. So, so yes, there's, the, you know, from the germ cells to the eggs or sperm, there's a change in the profile of gene expression. Uh, but in the fertilized egg itself, you still have to do that re rebooting once, sorry, once it's fertilized. Mm -hmm. So let's say that we have an environmental input and then the cell responds in a particular way and activates and deactivates certain genes. So uh, doesn't that information also need to be genetically encoded? I mean, the way the cell responds to a particular environmental input and uh, turns on and off different genes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I mean, you can see that in, again in development, um, all of that program for how those cells respond to signals in the embryo is encoded itself in the program of development. Um, and there's no, you know, it's the exact same principle if it's a, say, a single cell organism responding to an environmental factor from outside. There's no conceptual difference between those scenarios, um, you know, for every cell in an embryo, its environment is the other cells of the embryo. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It has to be, it, yes, there has to be a genetically programmed response where the epigenetic mechanisms are part of that genetically programmed response. Mm -hmm. So um, even if uh, these epigenetic mechanisms people talk about occur, for example, in animals, uh, in mammals, in humans, for example. Uh, I mean, because uh, the way the cell turns on and off its genes is something that is genetically encoded, then it wouldn't mean that uh, the environment would be directly changing, uh, I mean, behavior, for example. Yeah, well... Um... Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I, I think so. The environment, I mean, does change behavior, right? Uh, and uh, of course it does. That's why, you know, that's why we have brains, for example, to respond to, mm -hmm. to what happens to us and, and change our behavior. But brains don't work on that level of epigenetic changes and, and gene regulation. They would, like stable patterns of gene regulation like that. That's not how, that's not how memories are stored in the brain as far as we know. Um, they're stored in the in the in the weights of connections between neurons, and so you know e each neuron probably makes thousands of connections to other cells. And when you get information traveling in, it may come in. I don't know if you can see my hands here, but if this is the the dendrites of a of a neuron, so the input layers, you know, you might have one cell connecting here that's giving it some information, and different cells coming in here giving different information. So if there's something here in this that you want to remember. You don't want to change something in the whole cell that's going to affect all of its synaptic connections. You just want to change this one. 
that's where the specificity lies. So, you know, everything that we know about memory, not every, I mean, broadly speaking, that's how we think memory works in um, organisms with, with sophisticated nervous systems. Um, you know, it's possible in some, in, in some simpler organisms, um, there's a bit more, or maybe even a lot more kind of biochemical level um, changes happening that, you know, that might be the case in organisms that live a lot shorter lives, for example. But uh, because you don't need to make something permanent in the anatomy of the, of the animal, it's okay to, to change the biochemistry and, and sort of you right. can keep it like that. But for animals that live, a, you know, a long time, uh, making those permanent changes in really physically growing synapses and, and changing the weights of connections is, is a much more stable way to encode memories, literally inscribing them in the anatomy of the brain, not, um, not sort of temporarily in, in the biochemistry of individual cells. Mm -hmm. So just to see if I understand this correctly, are you saying then that to understand behavior, it's better to analyze how things occur on the level of neurons and how they establish connections in terms of neural pathways and things like that, instead of going all the way down to the genes and how they are turned on and off, for example? Yeah, well... So turning genes on or off is part of the mechanism that enables right. synaptic plasticity and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's a ton of, of just biochemical mechanism that has to happen in order for those neural mechanisms to happen. Okay. And, and frankly, there's lots of computation that happens in, in the biochemistry of, of neurons, in, you know, in the details of the synapses, in individual proteins, whether they're binding, you know, this cofactor or not, whether they have magnesium in the middle of them or not. Um, you know, so there's, at a computational level, there's tons of action going on in the level of proteins and, and biochemistry. Um, but in, like I said, in animals with sophisticated nervous systems, you know, where they have more than a few hundred neurons, say, um, and where they, where their, their lifespan is long enough to, to warrant making longer lasting changes and, and um, you know, configuring the circuits in a way that, that inscribes memory in the anatomy, then to me, that's the right level to look at if we want to understand why an animal um, has a long lasting change in its behavior in response to an experience, say. Um, and it's not that there can't be some long lasting changes I mean, there are some examples, for example, like the, the glucocorticoid receptor in, in the mammalian brain, which is a, a stress, uh, stress hormone receptor, uh, which, does, which does respond uh, in a way in some parts of the particular parts of the brain where it can be up or down regulated in response to really stressful experiences. And that can last for a while. Um, and that, that, you know, that is a kind of a biochemical tuning of a of a, what is an effect of biochemical circuit, right? Because it's a hormone mediated thing. So there's scope in that kind of signaling, sort of hormonal or neuropeptide related signaling, um, where you're sort of tuning, tuning some behavioral parameters up or down. You're not encoding a specific memory, but you are sort of reconfiguring a little bit the behavior of the animal for some, for some period of time. Um, so there's definitely scope for that to happen, and there are examples like that. But they're, uh, I guess, I would feel like they're sort of general, um, general responses to uh, environmental states, as opposed to really specific mechanisms for encoding. Uh, you know, this happened, and then that happened. You know, that kind of associative memories. Mm -hmm. So I've already asked you about evolutionary theory. What do you think about the, what some people propose? They say that we should expand with the modern evolutionary synthesis, and I'm referring to people like David Sloan Wilson, to include things like epigenetics. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, um, I, I don't think you need the mechanism of epigenetics to make that argument. Actually, there's plenty of arguments you can make about the, um, the, the organism in its environment, 
as the right level of um, at which at which to think natural selection works. You know, I mean, the, the, the gene centric view has been really dominant with the, the selfish gene hypothesis and the idea that, you know, we're the organism is just a vehicle for these um, these replicators that we that we harbor like little parasites. Um, but sorry. So I think it's right that we uh, should think of the organism in its environment as the thing that natural selection is working on. Um, and of course, there are ways that organisms react to their environment that can um, let them explore new niches, for example, um, that can ultimately feed back through the mechanism of Darwinian selection because their own behavior alters the selective forces that are acting on them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and opens up even new niches for them to explore and so on. So um, to me, that's a really sensible way to think about how evolution has affected, you know, animal and plant, um, the directions that have been taken along, along different lineages. Again, I'm not sure that, that epigenetics in the sense that we've been talking about it is the mechanism that allows that. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, you can have lots of phenotypic plasticity, for example, in animals that have brains, right? I mean, because, be, brains let you uh, react to your environment by altering your behavior, thereby altering your environment. So, um, and that doesn't re doesn't require any you know chromatin regulation or anything like that. So, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of of um, of the idea of reframing the evolution around the organism again, um, but. I don't. I don't see the scope. Well, it's not that I, there's no scope for it. I just don't see the evidence for epigenetics as a mechanism, um, or even that it's required uh, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So, talking about some particular studies, I mean uh, that people have been doing in epigenetics. Uh, if I remember correctly, a few years ago, some studies were published on, I think, maternal care in mice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, particularly, uh, I think that it was the way uh, mothers, um, uh, mothers dealt with their offspring, uh, altered supposedly their epigenetic profile. And then it was, uh, and I mean, and, and then the, the offspring if they were females, for example, would behave the same way toward their own offspring, I guess. Yeah, that's not quite um, that's not quite right, or at least it's not the ones that I've seen. Um, okay. So, so there is a whole yeah, there's a whole sort of a paradigm, experimental paradigm in in animals, uh, mice and rats, where um, if you remove if you remove animals, for example, from their mother, um, they yeah. get they get stressed out, and um, and there's some sort of behavioral things that 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 are argued to be manifestations of that in later life. So the mm -hmm. suggestion is that what you know things that happen during a critical period as early pups, um, in terms of the maternal care that they get, cause some long-lasting changes in behavior that you see in those animals as adults. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I mean that that literature is is a little bit um, variable, let's say, in exactly what these the manifestations are and how they, how they show up. Um, the big claim in that literature was that they were transmitted to the next generation or even the one after that. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's where this, um, this idea of transgenerational epigenetics came really to the fore, I think. And there were you know, lots of uh, papers arguing that that was the case. Um, I, I'm, really skeptical of that, I think, as you know, um, and have looked at, you know, in, in detail at a lot of these papers. And they're, they're, they're odd, um, I think, you know, they, you can see really sort of this pattern where there's not really a very directed hypothesis. It's, it's not very clear what's expected in the next generation in terms of behavioral differences. It's just sort of let's do a bunch of behavioral analyses and see if anything's different anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and then 
um, oftentimes it's like, okay, well, we, you know, we don't see anything generally, but let's look just in males or just in females in this generation. And maybe they see something just in males, uh, but just in two tests out of four tests that they do. You know, not for any reason that they thought of beforehand. That's just what the data look tend to be small numbers of animals. Um, and then they look in the next generation and suddenly it's the females that show a difference uh, and it's in different tests, not the same ones. And so the idea is, you know, it's, it's sort of zigzagging from mother to son to granddaughter, um, again, with no good reason, but it's sort of presented in a way like, ooh, isn't this interesting? It's sex specific and it's sex specific transmission as well. Um, and it's, you know, it's affecting these behaviors, but not, uh, isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at it statistically, it just, a lot of it just looks like noise because if you do loads of tests with small numbers of, of subjects, you're going to get some blips that, that look statistically significant on their own. But if you don't correct for all the tests that you did, well then, you know, you, know, you shouldn't be surprised that some of them show up like that. And if you carve your data up, splitting it by males and females or other covariates, um, you know, whether the test goes up or down is basically, that's two tests. So, um, you know, a lot of the experiments I think have been like that. And, um, you know, I hate to jump on a whole field, but I, I don't see any evidence in, in mice, uh, rats that that transgenerational epigenetics is a thing with one exception, which is interesting because it's an exception where, like what I was talking about in nematodes before, there's a transposable element that is in a certain mm -hmm. that gets repressed by chromatin, and that can be passed through the germline. Uh, mm -hmm. But otherwise, um, there doesn't seem to be good evidence for it. And also, there's um, you know more recently, as well as the behavioral stuff, people have looked at profiles of of um, chromatin marks or DNA methylation across the whole genome in different parts of the brain. Um, and they find some differences, right? So if you do a methylation profile of all the genes in the genome, uh, or even you know, some subset of hundreds of genes or whatever, uh, across many tissues, um, and you take, you're basically taking loads and loads of measurements that are inherently noisy and variable, and if you compare them between group A and group B that has small numbers in them, well, some of them are going to show a difference. Um, but again, you know, that's what we know now is not to do the experiments like that. You know, and we've learned this from, from history of other fields like you know, candidate gene association studies in human genetics, where people were doing the same thing, small samples, um, kind of uh, you know, not really a, a good hy a direct hypothesis about where, in what direction the change should be, just, just looking for something somewhere that would be significant. And then of course, a huge, a huge problem in that field was publication bias. So if you did a test and you found something, well, great, you can publish that, look, it's a positive result. But if you didn't find something, well, boo -hoo, you're, I mean, are you gonna go to the effort of actually writing that thing up? Uh, you know, is any journal gonna be interested in publishing it? No. So you end up with this really skewed um, misrepresentation of the actual experiments, the actual experiment mm -hmm. results, because only a subset of them get published. So the literature looks like, oh, well, these guys found something and these guys found something and these guys found something. And even if you go into each individual paper and say, well, this is not very rigorous and they didn't correct for multiple tests. And this is, you know, the, 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 the um, I, I think the tendency is to look at that and go, well, but wait, there's so many of them. They can't all be wrong. There must be something happening there. Where there's smoke, there must be fire. Um, but I, I don't think so. I think it's just a lot of smoke, actually. Mm -hmm. Haven't they also done some studies on human twins and analyzed their, uh, let's say, epigenetic profiles? Because I, I remember reading about a study where they showed an image that supposedly represented the uh, different epigenetic profiles between sets of twins. Uh, yeah. and, and they showed that they were different, something like that. Yeah, they can. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, as I said, cells respond to their environment and, um, mm -hmm. and our cells respond to, to um, our environment and our experience as well. And, you know, if you look at, you know, say twins who were smokers versus non-smokers and you look at their blood and the profile of gene expression in their blood and the 
methylation pattern, you will see a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and it does reflect some, um, you know, in that case, it's a, it's a, it's a toxin exposure, um, not a behavioral exposure. And in fact, there isn't good evidence for epigenetic profiles changing, you know, overall in response to behavior. I mean, there are some experiments that have looked at that, but weirdly they look at blood profiles uh, but, you know, which blood, obviously, the, the epigenetic profile of blood is going to be different from brain cells anyway. And one brain cell is going to be different from another brain cell, for that matter. Um, so, yeah, there, there definitely there are epigenetic changes that happen, and they happen as we age, for example, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just not good evidence that behavioral experiences really okay. um, induce those in a long-lasting way necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it seem sometimes that, I mean, people refer to epigenetics to, uh, I mean, to try to fight back against the idea of genetic determinism, but sometimes it seems like what they're talking about, we could call sort of epigenetic determinism, particularly when it comes to transgenerational epigenetics, because it seems that uh, a particular individual inherits a particular epigenetic profile, for example, and that determines his behavior. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a weird paradox in in the field of people who 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 sort of um, glom onto this idea, uh, because on the one hand, epigenetics is supposed to be a mechanism of plasticity, right? So it's a mechanism whereby you can change things, your genes up mm -hmm. or down, or regulate them like that. Um, and then on the other hand, so suddenly it's supposed to be a mechanism that completely locks them in, locks in those changes, even through generations, you know, down the line. So, um, which it's it's very unclear what the sort of ecological or evolutionary rationale would be to have those two mechanisms at once. They seem to be uh, completely opposing ideas, um, and I think I think they are opposing ideas actually. So, you know the. The idea that, that epigenetics is a, a mechanism of plasticity that allows cells to regulate their genes up or down and maintain that for some length of time, it just, it's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with that. that that's accurate, I think. Um, but why would you then want to cut off any future plasticity? You know, what, what value would that have for an organism? Why would, you, why would you generate a mechanism like that that undercuts all this great work that evolution did in the first place to make all of this plasticity. So, um, you know, it really was, it's one of these things where it's like a phenomenon looking for, or it's like a mechanism looking for a phenomenon, you know, or, or a solution looking for a problem. It's just really not well articulated what it is that people think epigenetics is supposed to be doing and what problem it's supposed to be solving for the organism. Because as we just said, it's we, we, you know, the two the two ideas that we've been talking about are completely opposing when it, it's you know in terms of what problem they're supposed to be solving um, for the organism. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to talk about two very famous studies, I mean studies that have been overhyped, I guess. Uh, one of them is the Dutch study after World War II. So could, yeah. could you explain what they did there and sure. what, are, uh, what they get wrong? Well, um, so there's a couple of studies. There's the, what's called the Dutch Winter um, study, and then there's a, a couple other studies, like one from, from over Calix in Sweden, where mm -hmm. there was a famine. Um, the idea is that um, if you have a, uh, a parents who... who um, you know, went through some trauma, in this case, like a famine, um, during, uh, you know, while, while a fetus was gestating, um, or indeed, uh, while they were forming their germ cells themselves, if they were younger, younger children themselves, um, that that could leave some kind of mark on their DNA um, that, that affects not just their behavior, but it's transmitted to their to their offspring. And so to test that, people took, you know, samples of people who'd been through these these um, experiences. And, you know, there are samples in in the low hundreds, not in mm -hmm. not tens of thousands of people. They're pretty small samples. Um, and then they looked to see um, in their offspring and in their grandchildren if there were any differences in all kinds of all kinds of traits. 
um, like uh, you know body mass index, um, psychiatric illness, you know, general things like anxiety, um, you know all, all sorts of different things have been looked at. And I mean, I'll go through one example. This is one from Sweden where um, they looked at the phenotypes in the children, and I, I'm sorry, I forget what which phenotype it was, but um, where their grandparents had been through this famine or not. Mm -hmm. And they looked for this phenotype, any phenotypic difference, and they didn't really find one overall. But then they split it, right? So they started to carve up the data into whether it was your grandmother or your grandfather who went through the experience, and then whether it was your paternal or your maternal grandmother or grandfather. So that's four great grandparents. Um, and then uh, uh, four grandparents, sorry. And then, and then whether uh, you yourself in the grandchildren were males or females. So you get like a, at least a 16 fold sort of matrix of um, covariate mining that, that goes on. And, and one of these studies, there was one of those combinations that showed a phenotypic difference. Uh, where it was the it was the granddaughters of uh, on the paternal grand the granddaughters of paternal grandmothers that was the only mm -hmm. one of all the combinations that showed an effect. Yet the title of the paper was "Here's an effect of famine, you know, transgenerational." And the, um, again, there's no reason why it should be only that particular one. I mean, you can. And they did, you know, argue some sort of mechanism about sex-specific transmission or so on. But you know, it's totally a post-hoc kind of rationalization, really. Um, no, no correction for multiple tests, no replication in another sample, um, and you know, you can even go to for some of them, it's like you know, what trimester was it that the mother went through the famine? Was it the second trimester? Or the third trimester, and so you can you can carve up the data in so many ways right. that something is going to show up as significant, um, but it's just uh, it's just spurious, just spurious findings. So, but it's amazing that people have you know they think these studies are really solid, and and not just in the general public, like many scientists you know think this is really solid stuff. And I've even seen people, for example, who who have looked at the mouse stuff. And say, well, this really isn't very good. The mouse work is just really not very good. But they start out by saying, well, we know in humans this can happen because of the blah blah blah. But the mouse stuff is just not really rigorous enough. And you know, if you actually go back to the original studies and read them, as opposed to just taking a citation of a citation of a citation as as um, as evidence, then you'll see that um, they just don't they just don't stand up in terms of statistical methodology. Um, as well as the sort of complete absence of, of any specific hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case of the Dutch famine, I mean, when they were analyzing perhaps patterns of supposedly transgenerational transmission of a particular genotype, uh, of a particular phenotype, sorry, uh, I mean, it, wouldn't it be even weirder if something was transmitted only by, for example, the grandmother, and it got expressed only in females and not in males. Yeah, you have to have really bizarre um, X linkage imprinting. Um, you know, you have to sort of, you know, you have you have a, to to construct a really arcane sort of scenario to explain that. And of course, like I said, you, post hoc, you know, genetics is weird enough. You can kind of find. You can cobble together some weird things uh, to explain a weird result, um, you know. But the, if you haven't hypothesized that before, it, it's really reaching, I think, to 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 say that. And of course, you know, it comes back too to the question of well, what do you expect? Why do you expect something like this to happen? You know, what is it about being exposed to a famine or a trauma or something like that? Um, what's the change that you would predict would happen, and why? What mm -hmm. would be adaptive about Making your grandchildren, you know, pre pre wiring uh, their their behavior in a way. Um, what about that would be adaptive? And it's never really very clearly spelled out. Um, and again, if you're a simple organism that lives biochemically, then maybe tweaking your biochemistry for a couple or generations is a good idea, right? But we don't. We have behavioral flexibility, um, and so undercutting that. By hardwiring, pre-wiring in some behavioral thing, just 
seems sort of bizarre. And, you know, should they be, your parents, your grandparents went through a stressful experience. Should you be more stressed? Is that adaptive? Should you be looking for threats everywhere? Or should you think, well, you know what? Bad things happen. I can't, uh, I can't be stressed out about everything. I'm going to lower my stress response. You know, you could kind of make an argument either way. It's very wishy-washy, um, hand-wavy sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I mean, I'd like to think about the, the example we talked about earlier about tanning. You know, if you go out in the sun, there's an environmental exposure. You could get a suntan. Your skin gets darker um, through an epigenetic mechanism. You know, nobody expects your grandchildren to have darker skin because you got a suntan once <laughs> or even a bad burn. You know, it just it just doesn't really make much sense. Um, like I said, it's, it's a, a supposed mechanism looking for a phenomenon to explain. And even the supposed mechanism actually doesn't doesn't make sense when you get to complicated things, especially behavioral ones where, you know, in order for a behavioral experience to be transmitted like that transgenerationally, mm -hmm. um, there's this chain of events that would have to happen. It's really hard to envisage um, how it would occur. So something would happen in my brain. I've had an experience and I'm going to associate, say, an odor with getting an electric shock, something like that, something bad, right? So... So then I'm going to send a signal. Well, okay, maybe the maybe the response to that is to upregulate the level of the odorant receptor. So now I'm more sensitive to it. it first of all, that that's not obvious. It's not obviously why what you'd want to do. You know, just being able to smell it more isn't obviously the best thing. You might want to actually associate it with a fear memory. That's a more complicated thing. But let's just say we upregulate one gene. Then, then you'd have to send a signal to the gametes to put some signal in the gametes that would reflect that which happened in my brain. Then that would have to go through this genomic rebooting all the way through embryogenesis. It would have to be maintained until the brain of that organism was formed when the effect of the mark is supposed to happen again to recapitulate what happened in the first place to to undercut the plasticity that was there, that was adapted in the first place. So really weird and, and um, you know, really reaching, I think, for, uh, you know, if, uh, this, this sort of mechanism where each of those steps would have to invent a whole new type of biology practically in order to, to see how it would happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, those criticisms that you put on the table, do they also apply to studies people did on the Irish famine from the 19th century, if I remember correctly? Yeah, I mean, there's studies on the Irish famine, there's studies on um, the Holocaust, um, and these, you know, they're very sort of emotive issues. Um, <laughs> some of them are about the, the psychological effects of things like colonialism and, uh, you know, and trauma and genocide and, and so on, which obviously can have really long lasting serious transgenerational effects through cultural means and through psychological means. There's no need, right. there's no need to go to talking about methylation of DNA to explain this or in some way to give it a, a, a more sciencey feel to it. It doesn't need a molecular explanation. There's perfectly good cultural explanations. And to me, I think it, it really, I find it actually trivializes the really real societal and cultural consequences of, you know, things like slavery and, and so on, which we still see today. You know, those consequences are still felt through right. societal means and cultural transmission. You, you don't need to reach for DNA methylation to, um, to in, some way, in some way justify the idea or, or validate the idea um, that those things are happening. I think it. I think it trivializes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's something to that, but it seems that psychoanalysts are very much into this idea of epigenetic uh, transgenerational transmission of uh, psychological trauma, for example. <laughs> because I mean, uh, they 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 don't seem to 
be able to explain how trauma really gets transmitted from one generation to another and then someone comes up with one of these types of studies we've been talking about and then they say haha so that's the way trauma gets transmitted yeah and i think they sort of point to it as proof and say look it's all this molecular stuff that's happening um and like i said it you don't need that to happen you, you don't need that as proof i don't think um you know the the, the psychological stuff is you know, it doesn't have to apologize for itself, uh, you, you know, or, or be looking for this scientific uh, molecular veneer to convince anybody, I think. Uh, it's perfectly convincing, you know, on its own about psychological and cultural mechanisms and so on. So um, it's a weird, it's a weird sort of sociological phenomenon, really. Um, and we've seen the same thing, to be honest, with uh, brain plasticity when, uh, you know, years ago, um, we had exactly the same sort of response where suddenly brain plasticity was this newfound mechanism. Of course, right. it wasn't newfound at all. Everyone knows that's what the brain is for. Changing itself is how it works. But it suddenly was this newfound mechanism. And, oh, look, you could you could wipe, you know, you could totally change your personality or anything. It made its way into the self-help books again. Um, and again, it was reaching it was reaching for a mechanism that wasn't needed really to explain the types of psychological changes that people really can undergo uh, and can even instigate in the in you know in their own psyche in, in some ways so um yeah it's a weird people like their sciencey terms i think and so um they they get latched onto in a, in a strange way yeah, I think that another one that really got overripe uh, and people used it to try to explain all sorts of uh, ways of how people and other animals socialized was mirror neurons. Yeah, yes, mirror neurons, a great cool concept, really simple to understand. There's some magic neurons in your brain that let you see someone else and empathize with them and so on. And, you know, it was never, it was never a fully fleshed out mechanism it was just the, the hint of a concept but it had a cool name and um it was easy to tell stories about it and suddenly you know you could you could kind of um apparently explain these behavioral differences just on this one type of neuron you know nothing right. about what circuits it's who it's talking to what kind of information it gets how it processes it nothing like that was necessary it's just the neuron existed or it didn't and that explained behavior. And I mean, ultimately it comes back to this idea that we talked about earlier, where, you know, we were talking about the idea, the, the sort of simplistic idea that Deepak Chopra would have, for example, um, that one gene sort of, you know, or a few genes correspond to these traits and turning genes on or off turns traits on or off, um, which is really just a simplistic, uh, you know, uh, naive uh, view of how the, of that relationship between what's happening at the genetic level and and your traits, which emerge over a lifetime of development. It's not even that right now your gene expression is affecting your traits. It's that it did affect how your traits and character emerged over your whole lifetime. Um, but the same idea happens at, at, at the neural level. People have this idea that there's modular bits of the brain. This bit of the brain does X and this bit of the brain does Y. Um, and really sort of simple, isolated um, view of that, which we know is not right. It's the brain is not that modular. There's definitely mm -hmm. specialization. In rare cases, there's really dedication to very particular functions. But, um, but mostly speaking, you know, tons of bits of the brain are involved in any kind of complex behavior that we're undertaking. Um, and, and tons of extended circuits, not just isolated little blobs um, of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. So what do you think about uh, modularity of the mind? I'm not talking about uh, anatomical modularity, yeah. but about uh, modularity of uh, psychological mechanisms. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. So you can, from a genetic perspective, for example, or even just from the psychological perspective, you can define various traits about people that are... Uh, independent of each other, largely. Mm -hmm. um, so st statistically speaking, if you measure, measure, uh, you get responses on a questionnaire for something like extroversion, it's largely uncorrelated from neuroticism or conscientiousness or so on, you know, the, those personality mm -hmm. traits. They're, I mean, but they're defined 
they're defined like that. That's how they were made, yeah. right? They were constructed specifically to be independent of each other. Um, so you can take, you know, that observation and, and a bunch of other observations about how the brain works too, and see, you know, end up with an idea that there are separate modules in the brain that are doing these different functions and they, they're really independent of each other. And that's not really, it doesn't really follow, I think, from the data, because what the data are showing is that you've got some, you can have some variance that affects one thing where that variance doesn't correlate with the variance over here. It doesn't mean the two systems normally are not in any way related to each other or that they don't have overlapping components uh, at the neural level um, or, or that they're completely separate at the psychological level either. So, um, I think the modularity idea has been overdone. And of course, one of, you know, in evolutionary psychology, it, right. it plays a big role because the idea is you could select for one type of thing and not other ones. And operationally speaking, you can, in a sense, I mean, we see it for, let's take dog breeds, right? They have been selected for quite different behaviors independently from each other. And you can push, you know, you can push one of these traits one way um, or another. But that's a very operational um, way of viewing what the, whether the trait is modular or not. You know, whether you can select on it uh, and whether evolution could, could in theory see it that way um, doesn't, it, it, it's one way of viewing modularity, but it doesn't support necessarily the idea that, that it's underpinned by different genes or, uh, you know, by, by wholly different genes, they can be overlapping ones, um, or by completely different parts of the brain, for example. So I guess, um, I mean, broadly speaking, I'm kind of on the fence about modularity in that in, in some ways of speaking, it makes sense. And in other ways, it's an, it's a, it's an over extrapolation, I think. And so we just have to be careful about where, what type of evidence are we basing it on? And what's the, what's the, you know, What's the oper operationalization that led to that thinking? And does it necessarily imply modularity from a different perspective? And, you know, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It's more, it's kind of a bit semantic, really. It's more a way of speaking, I think. Um, but, you know, other people have very, there's a whole range of opinions, as you know, on that, on that topic. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's interesting because back in 2018, I've had on the show Lida Cosmides, one of the most prominent figures in evolutionary psychology, and we touched on modularity of mind, and basically she said that she no longer uses the term module in her classes because since Jerry Fodor and the fact that he sort of talked about modules as being encapsulated and so sort of isolated from one another that uh, the term got a, a bit messy and and she doesn't she doesn't agree that modules should be thought about as isolated units let's yeah say. yeah and i think i mean it's been interesting to see that evolution of the of the idea and the use of the term in the field and actually funnily enough i think um many people in the field you know, of epigenetics are calling for that sort of redefinition of the word or, or sort of claiming it back from, um, well, either not necessarily claiming it back, avoiding it, it, you know, so if you mean chromatin regulation, just say chromatin regulation as opposed to epigenetics. And if you mean transgenerational inheritance, just say that. Um, and so, um, and if you mean, you know, cellular memory during development, we'll say that. And it, it, it would avoid all of this sort of conflation of different, really different things by, that happen to have be referred to by the same, uh, by the same term. Mm -hmm. So how do you think we, we should communicate about epigenetics to the general public? Because sometimes, I mean, if the science is overhyped, then uh, the way journalists sometimes deal with the information gets even more overhyped because yeah. I, I even read some articles a few years ago uh, implying that um, uh, I mean that the sort of uh, that we were even able to 
pass on uh, memories, but actual memories, psychological memories, to the next generation through epigenetic mechanisms. So, I mean, yeah. So there is a lot of hype. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you know some of that hype starts with with the scientists, of course, and it starts with their press releases and and so on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you know, journalists can obviously. Um, well, it starts with journals as well, because journals like new sexy things. Um, I mean, the latest one these days in, in psychological stuff is the, is the gut, the gut microbiome. Um, now that's the, the, the new thing and, and everyone's really interested in it. Um, but the, the, yeah, so, so you get this thing where the, you know, science finds something, it seems really new and cool. It's in some new yeah. mechanism we hadn't thought of before. Right. Um, now, a priori, your expectation that that's a real thing should be lower, based on it, based on real, you know, novelty that's sort of coming out of left field that doesn't have a doesn't have an existing base of support for it. It's just more likely to be in some way wrong or a false positive or something than to be real. But uh, and, and so you would expect that journals would have a higher bar, higher bar of evidence. So you're making extraordinary claims like what you just said, transmission of of memories from one uh, generation to the next should have a higher bar to to um, convince people. But actually, there's a lower bar because it's so cool and sexy sounding that journals want to have it in there because they know it's going to get cited and they know it's going to get media attention. Um, and of course, journalists want to write about cool, sexy things and they want to write about big new discoveries. They don't like writing about incremental <laughs> discovery where <laughs> You know, oh, now we know this protein gets phosphorylated here in this pathway, so we know a little bit more, right? That's not a news story. Uh, a news story is, look, Jesus, you can inherit trauma from your grandparents who were in the Holocaust. That's a news story. Um, so, yeah, you get this sort of cycle of, of, of hype um, around those things. And then, okay, so the question that you started with was, you know, how should we communicate that stuff? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, for me, the question is whether we should communicate that, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. well, first of all, it starts with um, it starts with better uh, peer review and better editing about what gets published in the first place. And I think, you know, the, across many fields, we, we're, we've learned painfully over um, you know over the last decade, um, fifteen years maybe, about what are now now called questionable research practices. So some of the statistical problems I was talking about earlier, small samples, underpowered studies uh, for the effect size that you expect, mining for covariates, making your hypotheses after you see the data, publication bias, you know, all of those things. And I think many fields, um, you know, say in uh, many areas of psychology, for example, neuroimaging, um, a lot of animal behavior, you know, they're, they're learning the, the painful lesson that you actually have to do things differently. As I mentioned earlier, human genetics learned that lesson, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. That's why they do these massive studies. But they had to reorganize how their entire field works, socially speaking. Um, so it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do. But, um, but that would be the first thing, is to, is to make sure that the science that's getting published is actually rigorous. Um, and then, yeah, the second thing, how to communicate it, well, it becomes a lot easier if you can, if you can trust it in the first place, I think, then, then you can know. And of course, you know, it's really hard for journalists looking at studies to, to do the job of peer reviewers or that peer reviewers or journal editors should have done. Um, we can't really expect them to do, to do that necessarily. So I, I think this, the first thing to do is get the science right. And um, yeah, and, and and not publish stuff that we're not really confident in. Mm -hmm. So just before we go uh, next year, you will have a new book coming out, and I will want to have you on the show again to talk about it. Would you like to give us a brief teaser of it? Sure. Yeah. So um, so the book is is going to be called Agents, mm -hmm. and it's about how life evolved the power to choose. So it, it, it sort of starts with the question that, um, well, we've been talking about it a little bit, the idea that, you know, if we have these genetic predispositions and certain traits, well, then how free are we really when we're making decisions? So I can decide to do something now, but if I didn't decide to have the traits that I have, because that was out of my control, 
then how free am I really if, if, if prior causes are affecting my decisions? And so there's a, there's a sort of a, a problem there and, and, and in neuroscience as well, the more we learn about the neural mechanisms, the more it looks like it's just a machine that's working away. You know, there's no, it's like there's no need for any mental content or thoughts or goals or things. There's no room almost for them to have any causal power in that machine. It's just patterns of neural activity that are dependent on the configuration of the circuits that's dependent on your genes in the first place. So, you know, you're just a machine that's been programmed a certain way. You're, you're just like a non-player character in a video game. You know, your choices are totally constrained. You, you know, it, it can look like you're acting, but you're not really, you're just programmed. So, um, so that's sort of the problem. And the, the, the way that I want to approach the solution is to look actually, um, to say, well, well, how could it be that we can have free will to act? Or how could it be that we act at all? What does it even mean that a living thing can do something? Mm -hmm. you know, even, even at the singlest, simplest level, like an amoeba, it clearly does things, or it seems to, whereas a rock, for example, doesn't do anything. Things, things happen to it, uh, but, they, but it doesn't do anything itself. So, um, you know, I think if we want to understand the, the sort of ultimate elaboration of, of agency in its most sophisticated form that we know of, which is us, what we call free will, we have to start, we have to go way back to the beginning and say, well, wait, how does, it, how does an amoeba do anything? You know, it's just a bag of molecules and atoms. They're under the control of physical law, just like everything else. Where does it get some causal power that lets it act separately as an agent, separate from the rest of the universe? Um, so there's, a, there's an arc that I want to try and explore there, which the aim is to naturalize ideas like purpose and, and what it means to be a self, um, autonomy, agency, value, meaning um, in simple organisms, and then see how those mechanisms have been elaborated over time until you get to us um, where, where you can choose to do things. Okay, great. So I'm looking forward to it. And thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, pleasure as always, Ricardo. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by people like you, so consider doing it. Otherwise, and if you like the interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Pauline Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Spigny, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Nguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omer Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslo Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Ethan Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adan Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazevsky, Max Belby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz. My producers is our web Jim, Frank Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, and Niruban Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michel Rogeski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.